my name is Mohamed al Kuli. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present at this conference. I'm excited to talk to you today about some complex uh, peripheral leak closure cases. Uh, we'll talk about some tips and tricks here. I have no disclosures that are relevant to this talk. And uh, we're gonna make this, this a case-based talk. So we're going to be sharing four cases of not your usual peripheral leak case, so cases that have a little bit of a nuance to them and discuss how we're gonna solve these problems. So this first case is a 72-year-old female who came with recurrent heart failure hospitalizations. Um, she's had a lot of health problems before. She has ischemic cardiomyopathy, EF is low. She's a porcelain aorta. She underwent a 23 millimeter sapien XT valve implantation at another institution via transapical axis. At the time of presentation, she was found to have pulmonary edema, her PNP was over 20,000, and she was found to have severe circumferential peripheral leak. Because of her surgical risk and age and frailty, the decision was to proceed with transcatheter aortic valve replacement, sorry, transcatheter peripheral leak closure. Some considerations for procedural planning is she's had an abdominal aortic dissection that is chronic. That's why she had the apical tavern. And she has a small septum secundum uh, ASD that is not closed. The case was done with moderate sedation under ICE guidance given her um, comorbidities. At the beginning, the plan was try to try to see if, if the valve can be expanded further with the balloon. As we know, the XT valve doesn't do that very well. Uh, so, but nonetheless, it was a low risk attempt. So we attempted to post dilate the valve and it did not change the leak. And then the second, second approach was to actually go retrograde, put a wire in the LV and close the leak through that route. That was extremely difficult. And because as you could see on ice on the left side of the screen, because the leak is circumferential, you're going to need multiple plugs to co close this. And with the integrated approach, we didn't, and the challenges with the abdominal aortic dissection, we couldn't close that adequately integrate. So then we switched to an alternative route, which is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, we kept our axis retrograde to the LV. We went through the atrial septal defect that she's the patient already had. Uh, we put a wire uh, anti-grade and we married the two wire via a snare then we were able to send a, our sheath or uh, plug deployment sheath through the atrial septal defect into the aorta without difficulty using this rail. So we created an AV rail using, you know, the venous axis um, that goes through the atrial septal defect through the leak around the aortic valve. Through that approach, we were able to deposit our, our, our plugs uh, back to back um, with you know, a sequential deployment technique. And as you can see here, we were able to put three AVB2 plugs that almost completely resolved the leak. Patient has done well and had a follow up with her up to three years and she was doing well after that. So the first case, as, as we've shown, it showed you an anti-grade technique to treat complex aortic peripheral leak. Let's switch now to mitral peripheral leak. So this is a, a case of a 78-year-old female with class 3 dyspnea. She's had some past medical problems, including three sternotomies, one involving a mitral valve replacement with a 27-millimeter carpential porcine valve. Came in with hemolytic anemia, uh, and severe anterolateral pervaver leak. Again, three prior sternotomy, not a good surgical candidate. We plan to proceed with transcatheter closure. We did blood cultures, they were negative. As we were evaluating the leak for its characteristics and features, <clears throat> we found this weird looking lesion at the lateral wall of the uh, atrium, as you could see here. And that we had not seen this before on outside images, and it was very close to where the leak uh, is. So potentially introducing some risk of embolization as we are doing the procedure. Unfortunately, the patient had the radial artery occlusion and a very small brachial artery. So putting a sentinel device wasn't that feasible. We've discussed the options with our surgeons, 
and we decided to move carefully um, with leak closure, avoiding that uh, very mobile lesion. So within, within, you know, this is an echo procedure. I always say that pervavar leak, especially with the mitral, is an echo-driven, completely echo-driven procedure. We actually rarely even use fluoro to guide us through this. And as you can see here, as soon as we started engaging with the leak, that lesion, which we call the jet lesion, because we thought it is, a, it is an, you know, the, the, the jet was impeding or hugging the wall, causing some erosion into the left atrial wall. That lesion started moving, but we quickly got the two, the first and the second plug in place, pretty much tucking that lesion underneath the, you know, the atrial side of the device and preventing it from embolizing. So I'll play that video one more time. On the right side, you see a representation of how that was done on floral. And you can see here the first device, it really tucked the stalk of that jet lesion. And then as we got more devices in, we completely sealed the leak and that lesion was, was stable without further problems. The patient also was, did well and was discharged two days later. The third case is also a unique case of a patient who has a double mechanical valve. Um, There's a typo here, I apologize. It's a, it's a 21 millimeter aortic onyx valve and a 31 slash 33 millimeter onyx mitral valve. Uh, patient is young, he has a Louis Dietz syndrome, two prior sternotomies sequentially for each of the valve, had AFib ablation um, and came in with Pretty bad hemolysis, actually, um, symptomatic as well. We did, the, we did the echo, and we see here that he had two different leaks. One is medial, which is the largest, and one is anterolateral, which is a little bit smaller, but still significant. Um, the problem is we typically, with these complex leaks, we need to do a rail. We need to create an AV rail to, to be able to deploy our devices in place. Unfortunately, because of the double mechanical valve, we could not do that. So you had to come up with some creative ideas. We crossed each leak separately. We didn't have, we found the ASD in this patient as well from the prior AFib ablation. So we didn't have to do our own puncture. We put two agile sheaths through and through that we accessed each of the leaks separately. The original plan was actually to put wires in the LV and do a venous venous rail and then use that to support deploying the devices. However, when we did the lateral leak, that seemed pretty okay and did not require a um, did not require rail, so we skipped that. The medial leak was much more uh, challenging, but we also came up with this other idea that if it works, we could avoid doing a leak, uh, doing a, a, a rail. If you if you pay attention to this agile sheet here. We had some tough time sending this, the, the device in. So we actually leaned it back on the free wall of the right atrium, sending a shovel sheath through it over the wire. That was successful. So eventually we were able to deploy one device in the lateral leak and two devices on the more medial challenging leak. Um, and the hemolysis resolved, the patient hasn't had any symptoms since. Our last case is a 61 year old female with class four heart failure. Patient has rheumatic heart disease, cirrhosis, severe pulmonary hypertension, had one prior sternotomy, and she had two mechanical valves as well. The reason for presentation though is different. The reason is that she's had pervavar leak done at other institutions multiple times, uh, closure, uh, transcatheter closure done multiple times, and this time she comes with high mitral gradients. And what happened is we do the floral and the echo, and we find that the one of the mechanical leaflets, it's, it's, in, it's restricted by the plug that went partially into the leaflet. So the ask was if we could remove this and try to plug it with another plug that doesn't cause this problem. Only issue was that this plug was placed four years ago and I haven't personally taken any plug that far back uh, before this case. So we tried with simple snare, we ended up having to use a, having to hug the device, not from its tip, but actually from its body and using a 16 French steerable sheath to get this out. So you can see the amount of force, you'll actually see how the sheath would bend at the bottom here at the end while we're retrieving the device. 
This is the, this is the corresponding uh, echocardiographic picture. Again, we did try to retrieve the plug from its tip, but that was not successful. So we had to go with the snare around the neck of the device and, and bring it from its mid. That's why we had to use a much larger sheath. This is the device that came out, as you can see here. We tried, this was a 12 millimeter ADP2. We tried to put a smaller one, 10 millimeter, but that still caused some impediment to the leaflets. So we ended up using a six millimeter ADO2 device and using the bulk of that device in, in the leak itself. That fortunately was stable and ameliorated the leak without, without needing further ones, without needing further plugs. So with that, I, I, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I think we've illustrated different tips and tricks that can be utilized in managing uh, kind of the non-usual uh, aortic and mitral per week. Thank you very much.